Welcome to this recording of Baselight for Avid webinar. Shortly, we're going to go live to New York where Mike Nugget is going to take us through the class he's going to be teaching. It's a two day masterclass that starts in January in New York. Later on, we're going to have one in Los Angeles as well. Basically, it is something I really wanted to do for a long time, and I'm so happy that uh, we have managed to grab Mike from his busy schedule. He's a very talented colorist working in New York. Um, he operates Baselight and Da Vinci and Avid, so he's going to be able to answer all of your questions. And I think what is very important for us is really to have real colorists uh, teach our classes and not just necessarily something who's going to be going through the manual. Um, why is this class really important? For two reasons. Number one, if you're a freelancer who wants to learn how to operate Baselight, this is a great way how to start. As a matter of fact, you're going to learn Baselight completely because this plugin looks exactly the same. The second thing is if you're an Avid and Symphony finisher and you came to the limit where you know, you're know you not really able to do everything you need to do in order to finish your shows, yet uh, you know, a particular style of program you're working on doesn't allow you to round trip to another color grading system. This is an absolutely fantastic way how to finish. So hope you enjoy um, this short webinar and please email us if you have any questions. Go ahead, Mike. So all yours. Oh, great. So thanks, Dado, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so basically, you know, me and Dado started talking about a year or so ago when I first took one of his classes and um, we kind of decided that this would be a good class to incorporate into color training. And uh, I've been working with Avid and Filmlight now for about eight years, uh, m mostly on the uh, Baselight plugin for Avid, uh, but also as well as with the full Baselight. And I've done some demos in IBC and NAB a few times and done some tutorials online. If you, I don't know if anybody's seen them already. Um, but yeah, so the idea today is just to kind of help promote the two-day class that we're about to do and kind of give an overview uh, <clears throat> of what we'll do. Um, it's kind of nice because usually these demos that I do are about 20 minutes, which is kind of what today is going to be like. And then, But it's nice now to have two full days to dive into things even more. So now instead of just glossing over things and showing things off and just saying, okay, that's it, you know, see you later. Now we can stop, ask questions, go into some details um, and figure it out really well. So this way, hopefully when you come out of the two-day class, you'll, you'll A, be able to use it and B, not be, you know, not be scared of it anymore and also uh, just appreciate a whole other system that uh, hasn't been taught through color training yet. Um, so, Dada, should I just go and start doing the demo now? Yeah, please go ahead. I'm going to do it. Okay your screen share. <laughs> okay, great. So this is uh, the Baselight plugin for, for Avid. It's the additions, Baselight additions plugin. Uh, they have it for Nuke and Avid, and they have a read-only for Autodesk. Um, I don't remember if there's any other s systems that they use it on, but I primarily use it on Avid because I'm an Avid person. Um, so overall, overall, we're going to talk about everything from how to install it, with the licensing, the different kinds of license, licensing, with the, uh, there's a freelancer license, there's a node structured license, there's a bunch of different ones. Um, so we'll go over all that, which is, you know, not really fun stuff, but it's something we need to do. And then, um, like Dada was saying, basically the overall idea of why this was kind of, I think there's two really reasons why this was invented, really. One is because people need to stay in Avid, and that's the biggest reason, I think. Um, and so quick, for instance, is this sequence right here which uh, I've, this is a, a job I did a while ago, but you can see how crazy it is. And this is, this is a cleaned up online sequence. So, you know, you can imagine what it looked like when I first got it. Um, I'm just going to delete these two layers because that's the uh, baselight plugin that I'll, I'll talk about in a second. So this is like the original sequence that I have. Um, I don't have this media online right now, so I'm not going to bother showing you the media offline symbol. But you can see here how just in an editorial, how many things were going on with this client. They had different plugins, they had their own color corrections, they had picture in pictures, multiple layers, basically things that if you were ever to try to come out of Avid, you'd have to do two things. You either have to flatten this down and bake in all that stuff, which is not great for color because then you'll be coloring on top of all the effects. Or you have to send it out to the colorist without him knowing what the final product will look like do the color, bring it back to Avid, and then apply these effects. And you know this relates to not only just multiple layers, but certain effects that are 
in Avid itself, like stabilizers and 3D warps, not not the resize, but 3D warps and you know fluid morphs that a lot of people use. And then, of course, all the crazy sapphires and, and Boris effects and any other transitions and things like that. You don't want to have to rebuild those. And I, I know known many clients that will um, kind of complain about having to do that if they bring it to another system. Um, so the answer is like, why not just stay in Avid? So um, when I put this back on, this is basically my base light plugin layer now. So what I have, I have two layers, one's for interviews and one's for archival purposes. And you can see I just throw it across the whole thing and now I'm coloring inside Avid, which is saves time, saves drive space, saves everything. Also a huge thing is now that the edit, the edit is still live. So when the client comes in and we're doing final reviews and they want to sl slip a shot or change an edit point or even change a shot out or just, you know, literally move two shots around, you could do that because you're right inside the editorial platform. Um, and then the other big reason why this is this came out is also moving between the workflow between Avid and the full base light, which we'll get into a lot more as well. So without further ado, let's just dive into the actual plugin. And we're going to go over many different ways to apply the plugin and how to put in your timeline the right way. But it's as simple as using every other Avid effect you've ever used. If you just go to the effects um, tool set up here and type in base, you'll see that base light film light comes up right here in the corner. And it's just drag and drop. So you can either drag it onto a fill layer. And if I do that, it's simple. But you notice I have color across the whole thing, the same thing. There's multiple ways we can change that and fix that, including inside the baseline plugin or in Avid itself to cut up um, via the, the layer below. The other way is that simple. Another w simple way is just to drop it right on the clip. So in this case, we're just going to drop it on the clip to uh, work with it. So I'm just going to use my effect editor. And in my effect editor, I just have one choice here, and I just click on the base light. <clears throat> when I do that, now we're in. When now we're in the base light plugin. So, first off, this is exactly the same UI that's on the full base light as well. So, um, if you ever wanted to learn the full base light, and you're like, that's exactly what I did. I was a Symphony guy for so long, and then I wanted to learn the full base light. So I learned this plugin first, and then you know, a year later or whatever, after doing a couple jobs, I, I sat down at the base light and immediately could start coloring because I knew I learned all these different tools and it's the same exact thing. Um, so that's a really good thing. I mean, there's, there's a handful of things that you can't do in the plugin, but they're pretty minor and you don't really run into those. But anyway, so you can see here, there's a lot of stuff going on in the baseline plugin and it's pretty intimidating when you first get in. But the good news is this is all, everything is customizable as far as your view goes. So if you don't like this view and you want something simpler, you could just switch to a standard view, or you could switch to a classic view, or this is my all view. This is my color view, which only has two scopes here. And this is my, um, my, what I call my big picture view where I can, you know, if I need to work with these pictures now and I need to, you know, for some reason, zoom in and do something on our eyes, I could do that very easily as well. So we'll go through all that. And, and the customization in base light is really, um, really unbelievable. It's one of the things I, I love most about it, um, as opposed to really any other system I've seen. Because even if I don't like this, I can just simply move this over here or make this smaller or put it back or anything like that. Or I can get rid of this if for some reason I didn't want this scope. I could just hide that really quickly. And I can put it wherever I'd like to, too. So that's really nice as opposed to like, like Resolve, which I also work on, too. Um, you know, it's not bad, but it's it's you, it's not as customizable as I as I'd like it to be. I wish I wish I could be able to do everything I want to do. Um, customization goes into all these things too, as far as your wheels and balls for your your panels. Um, it also customizes different layers you have. So, for instance, um, I'm actually going to step out and take this um, template that I have and actually put that on there. That's what I meant to do, and then I'm going to jump back in. And when I do that, you'll see this is my starting template and I have my layers right over here and I have 10 layers right now. Um, these are bypass right now, so they're not going to do anything. But if you notice when I do this, these are just um, edges. So I like to have my top, bottom, left and right edges set and my also a video Mike, set. So um, I wanted to, just a quick yeah. question. So these layers are going like a, from top to bot bottom or bottom to top? Yeah, so that so the whole base light, both the the, the uh, additions and the um, the folds work in what they call stacks, and and what that is is basically, I don't know why my mouse is doing that. Um, basically, what it is is it works top to bottom, like 
in the sense of not like an avid timeline where if you have V1 and V2 goes on top of it, you'll see V2. It's literally the opposite. So right now when I have 10 layers, the 10th layer is actually taking is the top layer, if that made sense. Hopefully that made sense. But what's great is also, again, customization, stuff like that, is I can literally just take this and move it. So now my seventh layer is below my sixth layer. So if you're if you're thinking in terms of like resolve where you have node structure and you know you put down ten serial nodes, this is the exact same thing. It's just in layers. Um, and there are ways to like in resolve where you're connecting the nodes and you can do different um, features. There are ways to do this as well, um, referencing different layers and things like that too. And then the main thing is that when we go to any layer, are these operators right here, and these operators are your main color tools. So if I just right click on this, <clears throat> excuse me, and then say change operator, these are all the different operators that I can change just this one. Uh, I don't want to use the word layer, just this one operator um, section, I can change to any one of these operators, whether it's a color grade, whether it's, you know, something color related, or it's a denoise or deflicker or a texture equalizer or even text, any of those I can change all these to. And I can change each one of these layers. So this is like having like a node in Resolve where you can do, you know, you can do an HSL key or you can also do a curve. You can also do a log. You can also do a, a hue versus something, whatever. And that's all in there. But what's great is in base light, again, customizing is you can put them in the order you want them to work in as well. So they work in order of operations down, down this list as well, too. So if I want my sharpen to be after my soften, I could put it there. If I want to change that up, I can just right click and change this to sharpen and change the other one to soften. And now I'm controlling the layer, the order of which the operators work. Um, and I can add I can add um, new rows to this if I want to and go on from there. And what's also great is when I do this to say layer three, I can customize this and say this, save this is either my default configuration, which will be anytime I make a new layer, or I can say just for layer three, I want I want it to look, look like this. And then when I go to layer four, it won't, it won't look like this. So I could say, okay, every time I put this effect on layer three is going to look exactly like this. And every time I want layer four, it's going to look exactly like that. So the customizing is, is, is tremendous. And I'm definitely going to spend some time on that. Um, we'll spend some more time on the, on the UI itself as well with the timeline down here that we'll talk about. Um, and then, um, you know, basic color. So, you know, if you want to do some video grade work here, we could just simply, I mean, this is, if, if you know how to color at all, you know, this is, this is all works kind of the same as we've always seen with everything. If I want to boost some saturation up, I can just do that really quickly and bring down my exposure, all this good stuff. We'll get into all these different things. Hue shift is a really quick thing. This is basically like your hue versus um, sat or your hue versus hue wheels, where if I want to just change the color of a shirt and desaturate it, I could just do that really quickly without even having to pull a key, which is really good. I think Baselight does that a lot with things um, where they do they do kind of things that you you know you want to do and you know how to do them other ways, but they do it for you kind of thing. So for instance, if I want to do a base grade, which is their new operator, which we'll get into a lot, this one's really powerful. Um, what base grade does is kind of splits the signal into different quadrants. So right off the bat, if I just want to take down the light here in the uh, window, I don't have to do much more than literally, or change the color or something like that. Just change the color. And I'm not pulling any key. So it's automatically just, it's it's very pinpointed to where it's supposed to be. And you can change these, these are all pivot point related too. So if I wanted to, and, for some reason, make it brighter, Mark, I could do that. And uh, usually, like there is a, always issue with the edges of a certain, like a region, like, you know, what happens on the edge, how does, base light handle that um that's a good question i'm not exactly i i know i've i've heard of that answer before but i don't really know off the top of my head i mean i know it's it's got something to do with the pivot points and you can um uh there is something no i mean that does it look okay or or can it break the image oh no i mean i think it looks okay i mean if if you so the, the good thing is if this isn't working for you, I mean, this is base grade was really used for HDR work, really for specular highlights and things like that to, to separate those. Well, um, I think it's a really good thing, but yeah, it, ironically, you don't get like a, a mat that you can see. So for instance, if I were to go to a key, which is something else we're going to talk about a lot in class and I key out, um, something 
and I just say, I just want to use my, um, you know, Luma values. So if I do something like this, now I have mat controls here as well. So I can control the softness of the mat or the in out or the dilating it and things like that. So if, you know, if you feel more comfortable pulling a key, then, you know, by all means do that. Um, but I think the base grade is like, once you get to you know it and it's really because it, it is really powerful that I think um, you'll realize you, you get to feel it. And I, I even talked to the base light guys about this. They said it takes a while to like learn and see where it feels good. And then once you do, you'll just know how to use it the right way. Um, so going into keys now, I just pulled a hue angle keyer, which is kind of like a, a hue, uh, HSL keyer in Resolve. And I'm just going to now call it differences there too. So, I mean, you could do anything you want there too. That the hue angle key works basically the same way as an HSL, which it basically is hue saturation. They call it value instead of luminance. Um, there's also another keyer here too called the, the D key, which is a three dimensional keyer. <clears throat> and this one's really simple to use because you just got to click and drag. So I'm just going to highlight her shirt here, turn on my mat and there you go. And I could just keep clicking and adding to it. And if I add too much to it, I could just hit shift and then take that out, which is nice. And then if I do this, of course, I'm getting quite a bit around them. I can add a shape to it as well. And the shapes are super powerful too, which we'll get into all these shapes. So I do that. Now I'm just working inside that shape. Um, we have keyframed. If you, if I need to move this shape for some reason, you know, if I want to keyframe it here and then here, I keyframe it there for whatever reason. Very simple keyframing. Um, we also have area trackers. We have uh, one point tracker, two point tracker, four point trackers, which you know you can use with all these different things. So if we wanted to do her face or something like that, I, you know, I would probably do that. Um, shapes again, once once again, the customized thing comes in play because like right off the bat, you have freehand rectangle, ellipse, and edge, and that's exactly what you think it is. But then you have quick shapes. These come kind of default with the base light, but what's great is which is kind of cool because sometimes like at this corner one, I use more often than I think when I got to bring down just the corner. But if I want to, and I say, let's do a new shape, I do freehand. And for some reason I want to draw a star, which is, that's a terrible star, but you get the idea. Um, let me delete this one. Sorry. Uh, this here. I like that. So I have a star there. And now if I want to, I can say, uh, quick shape preset, put that in number seven. And now in my quick shape preset, I have that star. So if I go to a different shot now and I want to apply that star, let's, sorry, let's go to a different shot. Uh, I go to shapes. Sorry, my, my mouse is being weird. There you go. So I go to shapes, new shape. And now I want to apply that star. There it is. That's something actually I talked to Resolve quite a bit about because I don't understand why we can't do that. Like for me, one of my biggest pet peeves is when you know when, when you're doing someone's face, nobody draws a, a, a perfect circle. So when you're doing a, sh a face, you know, first of all, I can um, quickly just do when I draw the circle, I have control of doing the aspect ratio as well. So if I want to, you know, I want to do this. This is like what you get in Resolve, but of course we're going to do this instead, and I should be able to save that. Because a face oval is like the most common shape that I think people use. So now I can easily take that and say, I'm going to make that my number seven and overwrite that. So if I go to another shot now and I want to add that shape, it is right there. There's my oval. So that's just, it's just again, more of the customization that I love. Um, <clears throat> there are copy and paste tools as well. So if, you know, if we're in one shot, we have the option to copy either just the layer, which would literally be just the number that I'm sitting on, or we have the option to copy the stack, which is the entire, uh, all the layers put together. And then once you copy them, you also have the ability to apply them via metadata. So we can do it to all shots that are on this layer or the camera using the camera or the name or the reel or the source file and so on. And you can copy forwards and backwards, which is actually pretty cool because sometimes you, if the light changed halfway through a scene, you don't necessarily want to copy that back, uh, copy that backwards. You just want to put it on the, the, the shots coming after it because you have to apply that. Um, so that's pretty cool. Scratch pad is a really, um, great thing, I think. So for instance, if I wanted to, let me get off this. If I wanted to save this, this 
color because I like it. Basically, like a still store. I have the ability if I hit the number key on my, um, I'm just going to hit one of the number keys on my keypad on my um, keyboard. I'm just going to hold down and press down number two. And as I do that, you'll see up here in the right hand corner the information box basically. Uh, there you go. Grab slot two, page one. And then if I hit my number lock button, it switches to show me um, all the different slots I have in within that's saved within the base light plugin now. Um, and there is 81 shots. So for instance, these are just things I was messing with the other day, or this is an old project I did. This is page one. If I want to go to page two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I have 81 different still stores I can save for this. And the best part is that these actually save as files on your computer on your finder level or in windows as open XR BLG files. So if I want if I like this shot and I wanted to give it to Datto in LA, I can just take that file email to him and he can open this up and now he can load a BLG or save a BLG or save as. Um, but the still, the, the scratch pad goes to a specific folder. So what's great is if I'm working on say this project with these, with this couple, and then I'm done with this project and I move on to project B, which is let's say this guy, then um, I can just move those f files out of the folder for a second, put them in, you know, to a dummy folder, and then work on the second project, and then just swap them back out, and my my uh, plugin will automatically update with the BLG files that were in there. So that's a really nice way to do that. This is also a great way to see what you're doing, of course. So that's really nice. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about color management. So if I uh, let me see if I there you go. So Baselight has great color management, working color working space, DRTs, and and you, you know whether you're working display preferred or uh, scene preferred, uh, we'll get into that stuff. Uh, it also follows from the full Baselight to to the plugin, so all that information will follow over if you're going back and forth with that workflow. Uh, we'll talk about LUTs and looks. So you know quickly, I'm just going to go to True Light here, and you can see mm. Mike. There. There's all my LUTs um, that I've Just yeah. a question. So does that mean that we could uh, be able to do HDR grading as well in Avid now? So the answer is yes. I have actually not done that myself because I think as most of us know, like once you're in kind of the HDR world, most people are working on the full base site or the uh, or Resolve or something like that. Um, but I mean, Avid is capable of doing HDR now, and I can't imagine that you can't use the baselight plugin to do that as well. I mean, I'll definitely look into that a little bit more, but you know, I was told the answer was yes since last year when Avid introduced HDR into it. Um, so yeah, and I'm not exactly sure of the workflow of that to be honest with you, cause I haven't done it yet, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you should be able to, um, so we'll talk about LUTs and looks and things like that too. There's a whole operator called look operator, <clears throat> which is kind of cool too. This is just built in and in here you have different kinds of scenes, styles, and if you literally hover over them, it'll tell you how this was built. So this this look is visually influenced by Japanese film reproduction and so on. Um, you also have display looks that are that are just right in here that are defaulted in here. If you want to do a negative or a black and white or a day for night kind of thing, it'll help you out there. Um, but like I said, you also have you can also load your own LUTs too. So this this is all the different LUTs that I have kind of have loaded right now. Um, so we'll go over that. And then we'll also talk about a lot of other operators that are not necessarily color. Um, I'm just going to undo this a couple of times. So we'll talk about things like, um, you know, the D flicker effect. And then also like, what else we got here? D flicker diffusing with we'll talk about transforming text. I mean, text is, is, is kind of a new thing. I think they just started to put in here, which is pretty cool. Um, I use this plugin a lot too for, for things other than, um, probably what it's meant for. Meaning like if I wanted to, you know, I'm going to draw something around her, but I wanted to replace her face with his, I mean, I know I'm doing this really quickly and terribly, but the idea is there that I could just move it over and I have his face there <laughs> and, and I can easily, um, you know, keyframe this around and do whatever else I need to. So I've used this a lot for like boom replacements or, or boom removals, I should say. Um, also blemishes on people's faces. If I have to get them out, I'll, I'll could use this. Um, we use it quite a lot to fix up, uh, cosmetic stuff on people. Um, the D flicker works incredibly well, has camera shake, sharpen text, um, 
if I go to, I just want to go to this shot for a second. Yeah, this guy's fun to work on. One of the, my favorite ones is, is Texture Equalizer, which came out of, uh, about like, I think, version 5. So I'm just going to quickly do some that, some that, some saturation, go to my video grade, take a little bit of that. So let's just say we like this color. Now, again, hue shift is great for like eyes. If I want to just make his eyes more saturated, boom, I'm doing it without even pulling a key because it's just specific to that color. Um, another thing, and then texture equalizer is what I really want to talk about here. And what this is, is it's a basically a sharpen or grain uh, or blur, but based on resolution and detail. So if I zoom into his face here, we can see... <clears throat> that if I hit the 32 to one, I'm gonna really affect almost a lot of the picture here. But if I do something like a one to one here, I'm really only affecting, and you could probably, you probably won't even be able to see this on the web, but I'm really only affecting the hairs on his, on his eyes. I don't think you can see this on the web, but it's really nice. So it's a nice, fun, it's a nice way to be able to do something without having to, again, without having to pull shapes, without having to pull keys and all this other stuff. Um, this guy's kind of fun. I messed around with this. If I really pull all these up, you can see I just aged them 10 years at least, you know, and, and vice versa. If I take them back, well, this is getting a little crazy now, but I blurred everything out. Now I'm going to sharpen things back in, you know, it kind of helps to de-age them a little bit too. So it's a, it's a really powerful tool. And I think especially with people who work in doc or, and or reality stuff where you, you know, you always have interviews basically like interviews is like, if you're working with the baselight plugin and you you don't want to use it on every single shot because it's too time consuming or something like that, call it, call it all in symphony, you know, do 90% of it in symphony and then do all of your interviews in the baselight plugin, because then you can start pulling keys. You can take down windows. You can, you know, fix their eyes. You can fix their nose. You can you know, make their hair darker. You just got so much more room to play with instead of just doing an overall, uh, curve grade kind of thing. Oh, by the way, too, for, um, for symphony people who I think most of them work with curve, you have a curve grade here as well. So if you want to, um, you know, grade just like you kind of probably already did in symphony, you have that ability as well. And what's cool. I like this too. This is like a very detailed, this is like a zoomed in portion of this marker that I did. So you have, you can go very detailed to just this one little portion, which is really nice way to be detailed. Um, and then we will also talk about exporting to the full base light and the whole round trip workflow, which is amazing because if I were to do that and I've, we've done this for many shows, network shows, DIs and everything in between, basically I just take this V2 layer right here and I just have to export an AF and all the work I did just now, like even this crazy, you know, shape I just did, this will come over to the full base light when they import the AAF with a, like a five meg file, as long as you're sharing the media, of course. And, um, <clears throat> all those layers that I did will automatically come over there. And then the base light guy who I was doing the color on the base light can finish off his color. And when they're done, they just update that AAF and bring it right back into the Avid. And then I now have all there. So if he fixed this shape, for instance, when I get it back from them in the Avid, I'll see that fixed shape. And if I still need to fix it more, I can jump in and still see all his layers that he did and say, oh, okay, he did a pretty good job on the shape, but I'm still going to tweak it a little bit more or whatever else. So it's really for, for yeah. like network TV shows and things like that. It's really unbelievably I, fast. It saves so much I space. I think this is amazing. I think this is, this feature for me, like uh, is hands down the best. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And it, the good thing is that it's amazing. The bad thing is that it only works in environments where you have a full base lightweight. <laughs> so, you know, for some of these reality shows and for people who are working in docs up, they probably don't have access to a full base light. So that's the, you know, the main reason why we'll use the base light for color. But when I, when I did work in a company that had the full base light, it was amazing because I can just do pre-grading if I wanted to for the timeline in Avid, then bring it over to full base light, whether it was me or someone else found it finalizing the grade and then pull it right back within seconds. And it, it was amazing how good it worked. And then the best part was when the client was with me doing titling, finishing and, and mastering and all of a sudden said, Oh, that one vignette is a little too strong. Can we pull that back? You know, in a, in a traditional way, I'd have to call the, 
you, know, you have to make sure the operator is available, the system's available, call them up, have them do it, send files back and forth, all this good stuff. And like, now I can, not only can I just do it, but I could also have literally their vignette. So if they just want to tweak the vignette, I could do it myself. So that was a really, really good thing. And there's also another way that they do this called the lens too, which is amazing. It basically puts the base light plug in, like I said before, like on a filler layer like this, and it actually reads the metadata from the clips below. And even if I move this clip to down here, the color would actually follow it and the color would be correct there. Um, that's, that's a really crazy, So wait, thing. wait, wait, wait. So, never... so you put base yeah. light on a, on a one layer and the, it knows that it should apply the right color to the clip that's below. Wow. Correct. So when I open up the plugin right here, it says lens. And if I say, uh, I have to load the lens, I think they might've changed where it went or I, I activate the lens. I, so I'll go to lens settings and then here I load the AAF if I had this AAF and then I say, okay, match the BLGs by what kind of metadata. And once I do that, and then I say activate, it just puts the color on here based on the clips metadata that I chose. And then if I'm back out into Avid, say on this clip that I was just working on and I move this clip here, or if I move this clip over here, that since that lens is activated on this be on this, um, base light plugin, it will automatically, the color will go with it. So that's a uh, pretty really ridiculously amazing. <laughs> um, to be honest, I haven't, I don't, I haven't, I didn't use that as much when I was doing this with the full base light only because it was kind of new. And, um, I still like the AF thing because I do actually like to see the plugin on each clip. So that, but that's just kind of like a personal reference preference. I know a lot of people that are using the lens. Um, and then last but not least we have, we'll talk about panels. So the, there's like a couple different panels that will work with this. One is the artist panel, which I know Avid's not really promoting anymore, but it does work with it. I had one at home for a while and it actually works pretty well with it because some of these keys are, um, some of these buttons are actually programmed pretty nicely. And then of course you have the tangent wave and element panels, um, the new, the new wave and the regular elements. And what's good is every time they release a new version of the plugin and the release notes, they also tell you all the different buttons that it affects to the panels as well. So it'll say on the TK panel of the elements panel, this button now does this. And it's like, Oh, great. That's actually really nice. Um, and then of course there's the base light slate panel, which is really the one you, you really want to get for this because it's literally, you know, this is the blackboard panel. Um, that is, uh, you know, base lights, um, main panel for the, uh, full base light. And if you literally took a saw and just cut this in half kind of thing, you basically have what the slate looks like. And then you, every single button that's on the main panel is on the slate as well. You just might have to hit a little, um, you know, function key to get to the next, uh, different, um, setting. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about how to, in, in, in the, um, <clears throat> again, with customization, of course, it's like my theme is there's a thing called chalk for slate. And what this is, is basically your slate panel and you can just customize this as much as you want. I, if I want to move this button over here, I just move it. Or if I want to drag a different button over here, I could just, you know, I don't have the slate panel connector right now, but I could just literally drag and drop this stuff. So you can customize that to your heart's content. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I'm glad uh, you managed to meet Mike. Um, I think this is going to be a fantastic training program. Uh, here are the dates for January. Straight after Mike's class, we're going to be doing some more classes in New York. I'm definitely going to try to attend Mike's class. And for all of you who stayed with us on this webinar until the end, I have something special. Here is the code for 10% discount for any of these classes. So I hope uh, we're going to see you there.